Hi, and welcome to another video from the CTAG Clinic. My name is Dr. Mike Lloyd, and I'm the Clinic Director. We're going to be looking at a question today that has been asked by one of the subscribers, Erica, regarding why is there so much fatigue in conditions such as dissociative identity disorder, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD, or associated conditions like OSDD or partial DID. And this is a very common question. So again, this is something that is that's relevant for many people because fatigue is something that is experienced and felt widely in the people of uh, that we were considered, say, to be trauma survivors. And often the people are very, very good at managing their energy levels. So they eat well, they exercise, you know, might have quite healthy, productive lives. They might not. But for fatigue to be present in people that have those good energy resource skills, it seems like an odd thing to happen. And yet this is something that occurs time and time again. And things like chronic fatigue syndrome or just general levels of chronic fatigue are very, very commonly expressed as a problem in people's lives. They might be functioning quite well in terms of the dissociation or the trauma, and yet the fatigue persists. So we ask the question, you know, why is this? And what I wanted to do today was look at um, one reason that we think might be uh, relevant in answering the question is why is there so much fatigue in these conditions of a traumatic nature? I'll start with uh, the perspective of what we're looking at, that we understand that trauma is held within a dissociative system for people who are dissociative. So the dissociation occurs to sort of wrap itself around the trauma. It compartmentalizes, it moves things around, it shapes the organization of the trauma in a way that is tolerable for the person. Especially if we're thinking about trauma that occurred early in childhood, that's the time when the person, the infant, the baby, the child is least able to contend with and hold any kind of traumatic uh, experience. So as adults, we can hold trauma, we can make sense of it, we can use all our cognitive abilities. As children, we can't do that. Sometimes children are precognitive, so they are literally living as bodies existing in the world, and that trauma has to be managed somehow to avoid being overwhelmed, which is a threat to the system. So the dissociation wraps itself around the trauma to sort of take the trauma away from the person's everyday life and functioning. That exists, and that works very well. Now, the problem occurs when the person then grows and develops and moves into adulthood, that that dissociative containment remains in place. Now, that takes an awful lot of energy to look after that. So as it's being held for years and years and years, what we see then is that a person's basic default store of energy is already being used to work to keep that dissociation in place. Now, we may think, well, why don't we just take the dissociation away and deal with the trauma? But that's not what a lot of people want to do. They want to dismiss the trauma, think avoidance of trauma, to avoid talking about the trauma, thinking about it, looking directly at the trauma is to deny that the trauma exists, is to take away that experience. That is a really natural response. And we're totally OK with people doing that because it seems reasonable to just not want to go anywhere near it. So what people do is they have this phobic response to the trauma, to the memories of it, to the sensations of it, to sharing it, to talking about it. There might be shame. There might be disgust. There might be fear, apprehension, dread, sense of consequence that something awful will happen. They may have been threatened to keep the trauma quiet, to keep it hidden, to keep it secret. So there's loads of reasons why a person will not go anywhere near their trauma, will not discuss it and maintain, therefore, that dissociative containment in place around that trauma. This is all about energy. It takes a huge amount of energy to actually maintain a dissociative response. People are constantly then going through life trying to avoid anything or trying to manage triggers or deal with triggers, deal with these traumatic consequences of anything that occurred and took place early in childhood. What people end up doing then is just saying, I just want to leave it alone. I don't want to go anywhere near it. I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to leave it alone. And that's fine. And that's what people do. 
but the trauma still exists. So just because a person may want to leave it alone doesn't mean it's being left alone. The body keeps the score. It is held within the body. It's held within the threat response system and all the neurological apparatus in the brain and all the physical response systems, our gut, our heart, our lungs, everything, our breathing, everything is connected to this trauma. So the amount of energy that is being used up on a daily basis to not deal with the trauma is enormous. And as therapists, we just turn around and go, well, you know, the balance of probability says that if you expend the trauma, if you expend the energy in the here and now and deal with the trauma, it will give you freedom of that energy later on down. But people are terrified. So even if they know it's the thing to do, they're scared of it. And then the dissociation can kick in as well. So a person might come into trauma therapy in order to be able to process and understand what went on. And then during that process, the dissociation kicks in, then they can't do it. That makes them more apprehensive, more dreadful. They flee therapy. They might exit, they might leave, whatever. And it stops them actually processing the traumatic experience. So the dissociative containment remains in place. I'm sure all of you will have heard at some point hearing a person say, it feels like the weight has been lifted from my shoulders. So they've said something, they've shared something, they've, they've revealed, they've exposed a secret or a shameful thing or an embarrassing thing or something. And then they've been okay. You know, people have listened to it and they've gone, you know what, that's absolutely fine. I understand where that comes from. And they, people talk about, they've shared it, a weight has been lifted from my shoulders. Think that if that weight was your trauma, how tired you would be having to walk around the place lugging that thing all your life. We are designed as human beings to be able to hold on to enormous weights, trauma, instant things for a brief amount of time, which is called the acute response. We are not designed to deal with the chronic response. You have to be heavily trained. So if you put, let's say, if you're training to be in the military and you put a backpack on your shoulders with like a 30 kilo, 50 kilo weight in it and you start running across across the hills, you're going to be knackered really, really quickly. But soldiers are trained to do that over a period of months and years and they can do it very, very well. We're not designed to do this naturally. So when we have this traumatic weight of our childhood experience and we are carrying it around with us for years and years and years, the end product is that we end up on our knees. We are absolutely exhausted. And the goal of trauma therapy is to bit by bit lift all of those weights out of that rucksack, start handing them over to the therapist who can take them away and process them and deal with them in a really structured and organized way that does not cause harm to the therapist if it's all done well and then the person is relieved of that burden and actually the trauma therapy then starts removing that phobic response develops confidence gives that person that autonomy over their traumatic experience the weight starts coming out of the backpack and they start being able to walk upright again possibly for the first time in their lives and we notice that the fatigue starts falling away that person's energy is already there it's just not being used to have to do this avoidant mechanism once the avoidant mechanism is taken away the person can then have that energy to use for positive things in life so enjoyment you know holidays trips spend time with friends spend time with family just being peaceful and not being exhausted actually brings out better levels of energy so confidence gives people energy phobic responses reduces people's energy. Once we've got that equation balanced out, a lot of the time the fatigue starts passing away. Now, if there's physical things that have taken place as a result of the long-term consequences of this, that has to be dealt with differently. If we're thinking purely about the psychological construct of it, the basis of this is, in conclusion then, is that trauma is exhausting. And holding on to trauma for years and years and years and keeping it locked away inside the self and not being able to share it, not being able to hand it over and be supported by another person is exhausting. So if we know it's exhausting, why would we not expect fatigue to be present? So if fatigue is present, chances are it's because there is a trauma that has not yet been processed or understood or walked towards the avoidance leads to the fatigue. It's a huge energy drain to avoid doing something in the long term. So I hope that I hope that gives a few answers, Erica. I hope that sli slightly answers your question as, as, as best as possible. 
Um, it's, it's looking at this as a normal thing. It makes sense that if you carry a burden, if you carry a weight and you carry it for a long time, you have to expend more and more energy. And the weaker you get, the harder it becomes, the more tired you become, the more energy, energy you expend, the more exhausted you become. It's a, another one of these closed loop systems. So hopefully that's been uh, a bit of a, an overview onto why fatigue might be present in CPTSD, DID, OSDD, all of those things and a few things that can be done to try and reduce the effects of that. So keep watching the videos, please. Keep commenting on them. Keep offering us questions. It's great seeing the things that people want to talk about. Obviously, we can't look at everything, but, but we try our best to uh, you know, figure out what the best answers might be to the questions that you bring. So keep them coming and we'll keep producing the videos. And uh, in between now and the next one, then please do take great care.